Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. So this week, Nico and I did a fantastic interview with the one and only Mr. Philip Detmer, who is the founder, CEO, as well as the head writer of one of the internet's biggest science channels, Kutzgesagt. So I'm sure you've seen Kutzgesagt and you've seen Kutzgesagt videos and you're very excited to listen to what he has to say. So without any further ado, let's get on straight into the discussion with Mr. Philip Detmer. Okay, uh, Mr. Zetman, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. So perhaps for starters, could you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your current role? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm the founder and head writer of Kurzgesagt a Nutshell, which is like one of the biggest science channels on, on YouTube, which I guess makes us one of the biggest science channels on the internet. And what role are are you having in uh, this channel? Oh yeah, so like I'm I'm, I'm so I, I I'm the founder, um, I'm currently the CEO, and, but I think my most important role is like head writer. So like I'm I'm, um, have like yeah, writing most of the script or like I'm at least heavily involved in editing and uh, yeah that sort of stuff. Okay, so generally, I would assume that people don't just say, okay, I'm going to start a YouTube channel now and make this their career. So maybe could you tell us a bit about your background, how you got into uh, like your YouTube channel? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I mean, oh God, yeah, like how, how early should I start? Um, so I, I think I started college because that's like the... The earliest that makes like the latest that makes sense. So um, um I, I did study um information design, communications design at, at university, and uh, I had like my focus on infographics, but like print infographics, you know, like it like um basically graphics explaining things. Um and I did that during during university and it was like all fine and good, and I thought this would like was supposed to be my career, but um, I was like, I got really disillusioned with the field um, in the sense that like, if you make a really great infographic, you look at it, or like people don't really um, spend enough time with infographics. What you're basically doing in many cases is make like fun pictures, that, but like they don't really help people understand that much. That's just like the reality of it, I feel. Um, so I don't know, like I was already like depressed with that fact. And but during that time, around 2010, um, on YouTube, there was like an a, like a science and education revolution, so to, so to speak. So around 2010, like all the nowadays known big explainer YouTube channels started, like CHP Gray, Minute Physics, uh, Veritasium, all of them. And um, I, I was just like watching them for entertainment basically not to, not to learn anything but like they were like entertaining and like a good good way to spend time as a, as a college student um yeah they spent a lot, a lot of time watching watching youtube during that time and then like a new channel started it's called crash course world history uh run by by john and hank green um and it's basically like a like a or like it, it still is but like back then the concept was really new for youtube because like they got like a million dollar from YouTube to to start a brand basically, and what they did, they had like an animation studio come in and make um, ten to like thirty second explainer parts with animation during their video. And when I saw that for the first time, I just thought like, wow, like this is so effective, this is so useful. Um, it really, it's super engaging. Um, I, I bet, like the, the script by John Green was just like amazing. It's an amazing explainer, an amazing writer. And the animation by the, the studio is called uh, Thought, Thought Cafe. Uh, and the animation was just amazing too. So I thought, okay, like that's something I, I, I want to try basically. So as my, as university came to an end, 
um, I basically decided to just try making a video as like my bachelor thesis and explain a video. And which was like a horrible decision because like I, I didn't know anything about animation. I wasn't a good illustrator. I had never written a script before. Um, <laughs> yeah, but like somehow it all worked out. Like it was like three, three really gruesome months to like make this project. Um, and yeah, I, I did that, finished college, and then I needed a place to upload this video. Um, so I just uh, created a YouTube channel and uploaded it there. And then, um, yeah, I think that's the beginning. It's like probably doesn't answer the question like how this became into a job, right? So I, okay, I like I, I just I continue a little bit further. Um, so um, I was basically a freelancer after college. I knew I didn't want to work in an agency. Um, I was trying to. I had like a personal project, like a book project. I was trying to get published, and another project was like these video things so like when i uploaded the evolution video it didn't gain any traction or anything i think it had like 1000 views which was like great um but like as a freelancer i thought hey this video thing is really fun and uh, it's like a lot of work but it's really interesting it's like felt really really nice to be able to spend so much time on something and and try to make it as good as i could so since i didn't have any clients after college um i had like lots of free time as many freelancers after college do i guess um so i got a friend together and just like planned on doing two more videos and i did the first one it was like about the solar system it got like it took like three months to make also grew some process um it got like eight thousand views and i was like super happy about it and everything was fine and then i did the second video or like the third video i guess and that was about fracking and that one it, like I uploaded it, I didn't expect anything. I like really the, the, there was like no grand plan. I basically was expecting the video thing to end after that, um, but it went for like 2013, I guess, viral, and it got like a million views in, in two days or something. Which again, today is not like now a video would be called viral with that amount of views today, but in 2013 it qualified, um, and what was like on the front page of Reddit and. From that, I got so much feedback and so much like requests for similar things that I just thought, okay, maybe this could be my job doing these sorts of videos. Maybe this can work. Well, that's really fascinating that your history has so many different uh, steps to it. So what, what was your primary goal when you started the company as Kurzgesagt? Oh, so the company took like two years. So like we are jumping a few steps here, I guess. Like my, my girl at first was just like make a living, honestly. Um, the the first two years, I like the channel lost more money than it made. So like like not like not paying not paying for the privilege of making these videos was my primary goal at at first. Um, so the first two years, basically, what I did, I did the videos. And, and they helped me get jobs as a freelancer. And I made this money. I paid all of my collaborators first. If something was left, I paid myself. Um, and I just like worked a lot, like all the time for those two years. It was so much work. So like, like 60, 70, 80 hour weeks were pretty normal. Um, and I was like, I had like an office in a shared office space with friends who like also like worked a lot. And I remember that distinctly, like like us noticing at some point, like, hey, we're never leaving when there's like daylight. And it was like the summer. It's like not, it's like not the winter. It's like the sun doesn't. Yeah, I mean, like it was. It really was too much. So like, yeah, my my first and foremost goal was to like uh, transform the channel into something that it, at the very least could sustain itself. It wasn't uh, didn't seem like a profitable enterprise at first. Um, but like, again, like YouTube was very different, like starting something like that today, chances to monetize it are way higher nowadays. Okay. So on the one hand side, it's uh, easier to get it monetized, while on the other hand, it's harder to gain the popularity. Uh... It's, it's harder and easier. It's, it's, it's very, it's, uh, yeah. It's it's in a way it's harder in a way it's easier. So like I I I wouldn't know what I would prefer to start today or start back then because back back then 
like the kinds of videos I made back then just didn't exist, basically. And today, many people do something similar. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, like, yeah, basically none of the income sources that exist today existed back then. So, uh, so you mentioned that the, the company Kurzgesagt, you started that a few years after you started doing the videos yourself. And then, so what was the, the impetus to start it as a company? So what was the motivation behind it? Well, at that point, like once it, it began to like make money or like a moderate amount of money, um, I, I, I realized that like I was like really heading into like a burnout. I had been working a lot for like, like those two years. It was like really intense. Like it was fun and I don't regret any of it, but it was intense. So I started to see, okay, now that I'm, I'm, I'm secure, can I get something? Can I get someone to help me? Um, I, I, like I, wasn't, I was doing it with one friend. He was doing the animation, but like I was basically doing all the YouTube stuff. I was doing the illustration. I did the research. I wrote everything. I illustrated everything. I say that already or not. And like I tried to... It's like I, I answered emails. I did like the, the, the spare social media that we did back then. I did everything except animation. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I had no idea. I still probably don't. Uh, um, I have no idea about business and how to run a business. I never wrote a business plan for Kurzgesagt and all of that stuff. So um, I was trying to hire people, and I learned in that process. Oh, like I need a legal, legal construct for that. I can't just like tell someone, hey, you work for me now and I pay you each month. Yeah. So I needed a legal entity, entity um, which was like a good idea anyways, because it, like, you know, like how things grow, they don't grow for a long time and then, the, and think, then things speed up. Yeah. And it was like, like that. Like, it's like an inflection point. Yeah. Like, um, so I had like, I got my first employee who still is with Kurzgesagt. Uh, and it's like, uh, we also like, I just want to give him a shout out, Philip Leibacher, who's like hugely influential in the company and like did so much for like the visual style we have today and like so much for the soul of Kurzgesagt. So like he joined the company like early 2015, which like was like legally sketchy. Like for the first few months, I just like paid him on, on like a, um, an invoice basis. So like the company I found it by, like, by the end of 2015. Like he joined the company as the first one in early 2015. By, two, by 2016, we were like seven. And then, like, at the end of the next year, we were like know, 15, and then like 25. And like then, I don't know, and we are like some, somewhere over 40 now. So, like, it's really, it's sped up quite substantially. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, like, if, if you're like a legal entity, you can't be sued that, that badly, which is like great. Okay, so how was this whole process for you, like uh, having to st like start the company itself and then also making the hiring decisions? I assume it's not that easy, like in the beginning, like with the, your first employee to get them. Like, I mean, how do you advertise for that? Um, and the then... advertising was like the easy part, honestly. It's oh. um, I don't know, man. I I don't think I did it well. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I, I can't I can't recommend all of my early business decisions. My my recommendation would be like talk to someone who knows how to do this. I, I should have done that. I, like like look for advice. I just like as many things of course because I just winged everything, which was like like in retrospect was pretty stupid. Like I could have like saved myself a lot of trouble. So yeah, I'm I'm so like. I know this is not a business podcast because like on, on that level I'm like I can I can or like obviously I know the business of what we are doing, but like how to properly run a business, I can just say, I don't know. I was lucky that at some point people people joined who like were like much better than that uh, than I was and uh, took those those areas over. It's just interesting to hear uh, that, uh, I mean, also, like, I would assume many PhD students don't have this business side to them, but then uh, they also, like, uh, later on, if they go into the industry, might have to, like, know about it, but then all of a sudden they are in the position where they don't have the experience at all, but have to make, like, decisions on this. So it's interesting to hear, like, your uh, point of view on how you develop, like, your own business. Yeah, I don't know, if, if I have a... 
advice or like what what people told me years too late basically was like get a partner who's good at that um uh, which I, I probably should have done earlier or like i should have gotten help earlier but yeah yeah so y you mentioned currently you you ha employ over 40 people as a part of goods kazakh so what backgrounds are they from and how diverse are they do you have some scientists as well employed like or people who were doing research before now working for the company people who are in business as well so what backgrounds are they from oh very mixed so like the 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 brand of the company is like creatives which most of them have a background in in graphic design to some sort to some degree with like many like we don't have that many people honestly that came from animation um which is like funny so like it's like a common theme that like people just like like yeah went for that um with us um or just like had an interest and that's why they uh, applied we have a few people with phds in in our research team um but that's basically the only field where like that's really like necessary or like not even necessary like um, but like where it's like really an upside um yeah i guess like we we don't have um hmm. I'm thinking now that I'm not, not saying anything stupid, but like, uh, or too stupid, but yeah. I mean, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, more or less. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, no worries. So generally, I think like maybe like in, in summary, what I found is that like um, people with like a not super straight career path are great for this job. That's how I would put it like for many in many fields it just like even like for the research and like writing part it's it's sort of great if you don't um have like too much of like a deep uh, expert background because your thinking is different so we we work obviously with loads of scientists and we have like a few scientists that um we re quite regularly work with um that like by now know how we roll and like now know like the purpose of the videos and what to do um but we work with experts for every single video basically and and it's often interesting to see that like they have a hard time like adjusting to what we are doing in terms of you just can't like like if you have like a 10 minute video that's like 1200 words you need to fit the topic in there there's just like it's animation. Animation is so expensive and so work intensive. You just can't make it 20 minutes. It needs to be 10 minutes. And that's quite a challenge. And like, I think for many, for many topics, it's, it's like an upside. Like, like, I don't know, me as a head writer, but I'm, I'm not an expert and I can just like see clearer in some cases, not always, but like in some cases, Hey, this fact is like not actually contributing to the understanding of this like basic concept. So we can just like cut it, but yeah. So no, this is very interesting to hear um, because I, I completely agree that it, it's hard to, as a scientist, uh, kind of uh, communicate your knowledge in, in a way that uh, people that um, are not from your background would understand it properly. So knowing what exactly to cut, uh, I think is very important. So it's great to hear that you are collaborating that uh, that much with scientists and also have both uh, types of uh, people in your team. So maybe one more one more question before we uh, go to the next uh, um, bigger part uh, would be just how how does does your position change over the years? I mean, I assume you also have to do like more business. Uh, things uh, nowadays and you can't just focus on writing i mean well, what you mentioned is it seems like quite insane like with the 80 hours working on the side as well like before you even started the company and now i guess it like changed quite a bit right yeah it's it's constantly changing and i'm, I'm looking forward to the next big change um i mean like the, the the first really big thing i had to give up which i'm still like quite sad about was like illustrating um which made sense because like I, I was like honestly one of the weaker illustrators in the company um and like the people that the joint were so much better and like so much more like made for that job so i stopped illustrating in 2017 which be, to be fair at this point i hadn't done a lot anyways um 
and yeah, more like of the company business decision stuff. Um, but in, and also like the, what should like, it's an interesting realization or it was for me at least that like, this is part of the CEO thing. Um, so it's like networking and like going to conferences and talking to people and like, this is so crucially important. And I, I, I always thought like, this is like, I didn't have a lot of respect for that part. And it's actually huge and like takes a lot of time and this, it, yeah, really uh, can make the difference in, in many, many, many scenarios um, for all sorts of things. It's just like super helpful to do that and also like know the CEOs of other companies and have like, like, like build like a peer network and talk to people about topics that you don't, have no idea. So yeah, that, that became a huge part. Um, and now at this point, I'm, I'm hope like I, I'm transitioning, I'm, I'm transitioning more away from that again. And I want to like focus more on the writing and doing less business, like more strategic decisions for the companies. Sure. The, like the network and conference thing will not go away. Um, outreach stuff, like what we are doing here. Um, but less, less of a, a like running the company position, which I'm also like not good at. Um, but yeah, like so strategy and writing and networking. It's, it's hopefully everything I will do next year. Okay. That's, that's, it's interesting to hear that there are so many phases that one goes through it because it's, it's a constant learning process as well, right? Anyway, so... So this actually leads me on to into in, into a completely different direction for some reason because every time I think of Kurskazakh, I think uh, science and science communication of some sort because it's clearly one of the most like on on the forefront of the YouTube uh, atmosphere for for concise scientific content as well. So how do you come up with the ideas for? a new video. So how do you decide this is the topic on which we want to make a new video? So how, how do you come up with these? Uh, I... Honestly, it's quite random. Um, the, so like since, since I need to like research most of that stuff, I want to like not hate it. So the, the honest answer is like whatever I find interesting on that day. Um, and then of course, like a huge topic list and like many topics. Like you research something and then you find like three new topics just by doing the research for something else and uh, you get distracted and you like take weird turns. I don't know. Like that's really a really creative, chaotic process. Um, I've tried to like make it more orderly and I've never succeeded. And by now I've given up. So it's basically, um, yeah. Um, as, as since I also like, I can't really, um, tell which videos will do well even after those years, like, um, I have no clue. It feels totally random to me. So it doesn't feel like, like useful to like, try to like optimize for success. So yeah, man, <laughs> it varies a lot. Like uh, many cool ideas for next year, uh, from stuff I read this year. Um, yeah, no, I mean, <sighs> last year was, or in, until now, I mean, it was a bit of a, I guess, maybe boom for the science communication since the vaccine stuff virus uh, or vi information on virus so i just wanted to ask you like how do you treat like more controversial topics or topics that are also more discussed in the um, society in general like with the vaccines people were like uh, i think at this point confused by all the information that they get first astrazeneca is good then it's bad and then now it's good again and now it's good for some people like uh, do you also, or how do you treat these kind of topics? I mean, so like in general, we, we try not to be very, um, timely, um, like we, our videos need such a long ramp up of months and months and months until they're released that usually reacting to current topics is like the super exceptions. We've done it a few times and always just like, uh, meant long nights and, and very tired people. Um, so we try to avoid that and like aim more for like, um, yeah, like topics that have like a long tail that work for a long time. So like relevant whenever, um, but yeah, like for example, like controversial topics that like sadly stay relevant, like vaccine safety, like we've done our videos on that already. Like well, we, we have, we had done this video like a year before Corona, 
So that's why we didn't do another one. We would have done another one if, if that wasn't the case. I think we did a video where we compared the side effects from like 10, like vaccinating 10 million kids with like um, M and R versus uh, 10 million kids with measles. Um, so yeah, we did a big coronavirus video, but um, in general, we try to avoid that. Like, and controversial topics, I don't know. I don't, I don't think we do too many of them. Like, like two or three a year, maybe. Hopefully, we are done with this year already. We did nuclear energy, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so there's clearly there is a. So you said the ideas come in first, and then you you form a workflow, right? So how does this workflow happen from idea to a published video, and what are the steps along this process? Yeah. Um... So usually it starts there with like the, the topic idea and like a general idea of like what I want to tell. Okay, I try to think of a recent example. Like one thing that comes to mind is this yeah. uh, big barrier idea, right? The great can humans travel yeah. Oh, yeah. across this great big barrier to? Are, have we crossed it already, or is it in front of us? That that, that yeah, like the perhaps you could human, explain for that idea for that the human limits video. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one because like I I, I remember that one distinctly. I was like at a conference in in the US in two thousand fourteen, um, and I couldn't sleep because I was jet lagged. I was like lying in bed. I was like random randomly looking at Wikipedia. I was like reading the Wikipedia entry for the local group, and was like like. I don't know, like like thinking about that and and reading up on like I just like interested in the in the fact that like like I don't understand our galactic neighborhood really like how and like why don't I do that like why has never why like why is it that nobody explains to you like which which galaxies are around the Milky Way that I found just like weird and from that I did some googling and I found like a, an article series. Um, by an um, astrophysicist who like covered this topic and I, I loved his articles and I got in touch with him and thought like hey I loved your stuff can we collaborate on a video so that that's and that's like a, a stuff like that happens right like frequently like I read something that I find interesting um, and then contact someone who's like actually understands it since I'm, I'm yeah I'm not a physicist obviously um, so that's like, and this process can take a long time. So like, then I usually I start like talking to people and then researching or my research team is like preparing stuff. Um, and I go through that. And from, from that, and this process can take like weeks or months or years in some cases. And from that, I usually write like the first draft of a script, which is usually too long and pretty bad. Um, and then I just like, try to like rework it and refine it and, and go over it over and over and over again. It's like a lot, again, it can take a long time until it feels readable to me. Um, and then I sh like I showed like a few people I trust to like read it and give me like their opinions in the sense of like, hey, do you get what we are saying in this script? Like, is it make, like you're not an expert too, but like, do you get it? But because at this point, I usually am too deep in the research and I'm still, like I understand enough that I don't, that I may not get all the details anymore. Like I, like I may, at this point, I may be uh, inclined to like, like think something, think that something is obvious when it's really not. And after I got this feedback, I usually show it to like, and like two to three experts to get, get their feedback on. And then we have the script. So again, like this process can, can be very short or like very long. Um, then it goes to like our illustration department who do like sketches for the whole video. The, the sketches get approved. Um, then they illustrate the whole video. Um, and in this process, that may sometimes there are like still edits on the script when the illustrators say, like, hey, can we say this like a, if, if we change the sentence a little bit, like we can make a much clearer explanation. Um, after that, the, the script is recorded. Um, and then everything is brought together at the, with the animation team who make everything move and like look beautiful, like a film. Or they create the film. Uh, and the last step is our um, two composers who then write original music and try to like catch the catch and amplify the feeling that is like supposed to be transmitted with the video. And then like. <laughs> 
um, yeah, a few months after the first idea at the earliest we have a video. That's a very elaborate process. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's yeah. I mean, but that's how you get the yeah. quality, I assume. Otherwise, of course, uh, it wouldn't be as good as it is. And I mean, from our background, I guess one thing that is uh, quite interesting is the role of the scientists in this whole pipeline. Um, so how do you, like, when uh, do you actually reach out to scientists on a certain topic? And how or what do they actually contribute usually? So usually we, we, we try reaching out um, already during the... Um, It, it really depends on the topic because it's like it, depending on the topic it's harder or easier to get input um uh the harder it is the earlier we try to like find someone um so usually during the late research process or like during the early script phases we, we reach out to a bunch of people until we get like a few yeses um in in for certain topics, we again like have people we work with regularly, so we'll just give them give it them a heads up. Hey, we have something. So we will have something for you in a few days. Um, I mean, what's their role? The their, their, their most important role is to tell us where we are talking bullshit. Um, so so finding mistakes or misconceptions that we just have because we are not experts. So it's. Um, in a, in, a, in a way, I, I like I don't like that's like too much of a statement, but like in a way, I want the videos to be like peer reviewed. Um, that's also why we reach out to m multiple scientists. We really try to not have one, or, and even like in some cases, not even two, because it's like we had that in the past that like one expert just like had an opinion, and we had to realize, oh shit, like scientists are people. That's interesting. And and people can like like they can be wrong, they can be super biased, they can believe in a fr in fringe stuff, or they can just like discard part of the scientific discussion that they are just like um, they don't believe in, or they like they are super convinced uh, that like whatever their like corner of the field is doing is correct and the others are idiots. Um, so to, uh, to to avoid that as good as possible and like with as much. Uh, We can't obviously like, like we're still making 10 minute animation videos on YouTube, so we can't go totally overboard with that. We're like not writing peer reviewed papers, but we try to get like different perspectives. Or, for example, on a topic like nuclear energy, we try to get opinions from like a pro nuclear and an anti nuclear scientist just to like just to be sure like um, um, we didn't like use all of like we, we didn't use their opinions equally, but we wanted to at least like hear, hey, like someone who's against that, what I like their main arguments, and did we feel we addressed that? Um, so that that's really the role of the scientists, like really, can't, like yeah, give us a peek into their vast knowledge and experience. So before you mentioned that uh, you are building like your network. So how big is this network of also scientists that you have that you contact more regularly? Uh, okay, so like people we work really often with are like four or five people, um, and but like in in like the whole I don't know like a few dozen. I I, I can't tell you exact number we with like like lists and lists and also like what happens is like for many. Like generally, it's like not that hard to get people to contribute because people really want to. So like, especially like the more niche the field is, like the more happy people are to like get get an email from us. And on the opposite, like we get many emails from people who say like, "Hey, I'm an expert for that. If you ever do a video, like remember me." And we do that. Like we have a list. We we. Um, Yeah, and when, when someone contacts us, uh, and when we, or like when we do a topic, we, we always check the list first. Like, okay, do we have someone who's like already happy to help? Um, so if, if any, any sorts of experts are, are like hearing this, please like drop us a line. Um, uh, yeah, like we, 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 we're super happy to hear from you. And um, it's, I don't know, we really, we, we're doing our best to like not give you too much headaches. Although you will, you will probably have some, to be fair. But yeah, um. yeah. So, so this seems like a very extensive process, yeah. the whole thing, right? So, how many working hours tend to go into, let's say, production of one video? It's probably, well, what would you estimate? 
at, le at least 1,200. So 1,200 working hours per video yeah. go into the production. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah like, like, ten, like, like split on, on 10 people up, like, on average. I think that's, I mean, that's a fair estimate, yeah. Yeah, so this kind of leads me into the next question because now with the popularity of that science is gaining, it, it, it becomes more and more difficult for us to get our facts straight, right? So, so probably I would assume with, especially with uh, s some more, more recent sort of science, like newer science, it's, it's a bit more difficult to say this is exactly what is fact and this is exactly what, is, what things are being researched upon. Or, uh, or for like older stuff, which are established theories or established things with proofs, it's probably more easier. So how do you go, like how, how important of a role does this fact-checking process play a role in your uh, current, uh, during the workflow? I mean, it's hugely important. Um, it's, um, it, it, it has been a development on, on YouTube. So when, when I started, I basically did none of all of that, or like really very little. Um, and then like, as I did the first videos, I realized, oh, like I need to do better. So like I, I started reading books for videos. Um, and then I realized, okay, well, like, oh, okay, that's like not ideal. So like books can also be super biased and also like many books are written by journalists and like, ah, uh, and like, like I decided, okay, like books, it, like in general books and like, like article, like science, like articles about science written by journalists don't count. So the next step would go like to start reading papers. Um, and then we had like videos based around one paper and then we realized, oh, okay, but like that's also not enough because like one paper really doesn't tell you anything. So you need to read ideally a few papers. Um, and then we started really going, ah, that's also like, like not ideal. We need to talk to experts. And then we discovered what I said before that like, ah, huh, okay. Like, ah, scientists are people. That's too bad. Um, and like, uh, so we need to have ideally more scientists. And then the next step is like, okay, like if we look at primary sources, ideally, if we can, we, we, we should look if that like, is there a white paper for the field that like summarizes like where everything is at right now, or like other meta studies. And looking, looking at that, like, not just like, I mean, like you guys know, it's so hard, my God. And, and like, for sure, we are, we are far from perfect. Like we do our best. Um, but yeah, we have, we have like the same problem. We also are just people, um, trapped in those meat machines without like, uh, like good, good, uh, good software. Um. And yeah, man, like, like for, like for some, for some re videos, I think we, it, it's just like a really hard balance to like summarize the science in a way that's like not too, um, that's like, just like not too wrong. Like summarizing science is always wrong to a degree. Um, and just like, it's a balance to not be too wrong. And like, I'm, I'm, we do our best, but we not, we also don't always hit that line perfectly. Um, but like speaking of that, I think what's really important to me is like to like really stress that you're not learning stuff when you watch our videos. Like the you don't watch our video on on like I don't know what's what's a good example on string theory and you have understood string theory. Like no, man, like not at all. Like our videos are mainly there to like popularize ideas and like create curiosity to like then inspire people to do actual learning. I don't think like much of the, like maybe like crash course is an example, like it's, it's, it's an exception, but like most of the of, of science communication, I really would put harshly into like entertainment and not into like learning. Like again, like your PhD students, you know, like learning a topic and just like watching a quick video, it's like not, not close. It's like very different things. And yeah, I don't know, like, um, it, it is been... hard because, uh, yeah, many people don't like confuse those two. Mm -hmm. no, that, that, that's very true. I mean, one question I had like, uh, on a thing you mentioned before is actually, so, uh, what do you do, uh, when something, uh, like goes wrong and 
someone calls you out on it. Because the good thing for us, like usually the literature and the articles, not many people in society read it, right? Whereas <laughs> you, like you become, you have a platform, you have like a lot of a uh, huge audience. So you become quite attackable or vulnerable in this sense. So how yeah, do you and, deal uh, with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sucks. <laughs> so like, uh, it, it really sucks when that happens. Um, and it, it happens regularly. Um, and there's like, it depends on the mistake. There's like multiple levels. Um, like the, the, the worst contenders we had for that, we just deleted the videos. Um, but like that was a few years ago that we had to do that the last time. Um, then there, if there's, if there's like, like for example, if there, there's like mistakes that we, we said like billion instead of million, which happened way more often than I'd, I'd like to admit. Stuff like that, like like where you just like on the screen, there's like a zero too much or some something like like these really like ah, that's so annoying. Or like on in, on our latest video, we we act, we had like a for like a, a disputed fact. We wanted to put it in the video because it like it was really works well within the narration, but we originally had like a little birdie with like a thought bubble who said, "Hey, this is a very disputed study." Just FYI. So like, we're not saying this is how it happened, but like, this is contested. And then in the final render, we forgot to put it in. And now like, it, so this is like, and then of course people have called us out like hours after we uploaded them. Like, like, hey, like, I don't think it's cool of you that you, you're like presenting this fact as, as this, this information as fact. It's not like how unlikely of you. And that's like, you want to die when you see those kinds of mistakes because they're so unnecessary and, and annoying. And it depends on how bad it is. Um, if it's not really bad and nobody notices, uh, we can just like leave it. Um, but we, what we can do from time to time, and that's like a like, I'm not even sure if I'm super allowed to say this, but like in certain cases, YouTube will replace the video for you. If it's not in very, it's like very, very, very rare cases. So like, like even like we, with a big channel, we don't have like access to that as a feature. Very, very rare cases. If if the video is basically the same, except like a little nudge, YouTube sometimes very seldomly. Please, YouTube, don't take this away from us. Very seldomly, yeah. they exchange a video. Yeah. But it's not I'm, something I would bet on. So like like being not having the mistake is the best way yeah. to do that. I mean, this 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 is actually I think public uh, knowledge because it was. So I listened to uh, you know Marquez Brown Lee's podcast. Uh, so and he he informed that YouTube does this does you know this this video switching thing and in certain rare cases they permit. So I don't think it's something that is okay. uh, not <laughs> public knowledge. <laughs> That's very good to hear. So like if, if he said it, like like uh, YouTube loves him way more than us. So like um, although we have a good relationship with YouTube, but like okay, if he said it, I feel I feel great. So yeah, like sometimes yeah. YouTube does that, and like we've done that a few times with like mistakes that are just super unnecessary. Yeah. So this so this actually leads me into uh, another question. So because there's a lot of crosstalk now between scientists and designers. So is there is there do you sort of learn some things by interaction with let's say the other spectrum of people, like people who are doing things slightly different? For example, I think scientists, if you say uh, a leads to B, we, we assume A leads to B, and that's it. And we, we, we're not allowed to speculate. So we, we can speculate, but we have to call that in the discussion. We say, perhaps because A leads to B, C is a possibility, which is, a, which is downstream of B from this reference. So, and so the, the, the point I'm trying to make, or the question I'm trying to ask is, how do you, so have you learned from scientists as designers that there are, there is this, this sort of different thought process that goes on and have the scientists who work with you learned how to make their presentations of like, you know, their science a bit better somehow, because most scientists' uh, PowerPoints are very boring and in comic sense. And, you know, <laughs> that's not really fun to, that's not really fun to uh, look at either. So do, do you see this sort of uh, comparative learning going on when you have interactions with scientists? So I can't speak for the scientists, uh, honestly, because I, I just don't know. Um, I mean, the design is just like, it's, uh, it's annoying and it takes time. So I, I get why scientists just like, like don't want to get into that because it's like, that's actually not their job. Um, 
but yeah, like just like, but like as you said, like the sciences would benefit from like more designers on staff in universities for sure. Um, on the other hand, yeah, for sure. Like I don't know. I'm, um, I'm not sure if I can remember like an example real quick, but just like the the way of thinking and approaching facts and like all those like really taking in all these uncertainties has hugely influenced like like how we do things and like my writing and just um i would say i think you can like if if you uh, if you don't have anything to do and want to watch all of our videos back to back you can just like clearly see that at the beginning much more confident statements and over time way more words creeping in like may or like could be like like many more qualifiers um because like you can't qualify everything as a scientist does scientist does in a paper in a, like such a short video but like um, we generally present things I, I hope at least we present things uh, with enough qualifiers so like not every scientist watching loses their mind um but yeah for sure like the it, it was also like a really interesting learning process to just like see how 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 brittle our grasp of reality is. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that I really noticed when you... Uh, uh, so there was a recent uh, uh, video, right? Like, which was kind of like a recap of an older video, but with yeah. much more information, much more newer information. So how do you accustom... So Because a lot of science is still developing. And yeah. when do you decide that you want to make a new video with a, with a little bit more information, which makes... Uh, like a, a much nicer video. So how do you decide on uh, doing that? So for, for we we did that two times this year, or, and like we are redoing some of the oldest videos. Um, for one, we did we redid our black hole video just because the old one was like super ugly and like like it was like one of the last ones where I like illustrated, um, and just like not very in depth. Um, I made it just like twice as long and, and it's super beautiful, like the team outdid itself once again. And the other one was actually a video where we had a, I, I, I would say a relevant mistake, a mistake that really sucked. It was like bigger than having like, it was like a numbers mistake, but it was like wrong about like a central idea by like a factor of like 1000 or something. Or like, a, like that, that, that was like, so like the original video had a mistake that was like bad enough that the original video was wrong, but like not bad enough that the experts who spoke about that video to ask if we should like delete it said like, no, it's fine, keep it up. So it was like in a weird twilight zone, right between, oh, this is bad, you should delete it. And yeah, that's, that's fine, leave it. So we redid that for that reason. It took us a few years to like finally get it out, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason for that. So maybe on a bit of another note, um, let's say you, I don't know, there's, for example, the flat earthers that are somewhat of a conspiracy, right? That are a clear, like misinformation that is happening yeah. on YouTube. And I mean, there's a bunch of these topics. So do you try to also, if you see that something like this is gaining popularity at some point, uh, try to address the topic in, in your kind of way? We, we did a few times with like flat earthers. I just like feel... I don't know. I, like, I, like, like, do we need, really need to like, like, still beat on that dead horse? Like, so many great YouTubers have done that. I'm like, I, I hope, I hope we are done with flat Earth. Oh God, I hope. But like, the, yeah, just um, a small, a small comment because I remember I think the Flat Earth Society tweeted that we have members all around the world. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, it's not like like. It's it's a complicated process, like problem why why these kinds of ideas exist and why this community exists and I, I guess like a lot of that has to do that it has become a community, and people have their relationships in there and like it's like nobody wants to lose their friends, but like if you're like friends of lots of like if if the basis for your friendships is like that you believe in this like big thing, it's not so easy to like give that up because you will lose all your friends and who wants to do that. And like it's not like it's not like you gain anything um, if you like go back to the world that like hey I don't believe in flat Earth anymore like like people will not like welcome you with open arms will tell you like like finally you idiot so I don't know it's it's once like communities like form around these things it's really harsh or, like hard to like resolve them again I don't know so like, um, we did we did anti vaxxers with like our vaccine side effect video. 
we did homeopathy a few years ago. So we did a few of those, but like it's it's not a central theme of the channel, honestly. Um, my like how or like what we did like electromagnetic radiation and like like cell phones like that we did that like short people for five G became a thing. My my general opinion on these things is like that you can it's really hard to like convince people who are like already um, really convinced by an idea. Um, so when we do videos addressing these sorts of topics, like the target audience is the unconvinced people. And we basically ignore the, the like we ignore the people who like are like super arrogantly dismissing those people, and we ignore the people who like already convinced that like the thing is is real. I don't think you you can really get the, like it's the most effective way. But like for the vaccine video, for example, like the, like the target audience was specifically people worried about side effects mm. that were not yet anti vaxxers yeah. Okay. So that uh, so that actually takes me off on a tangent because we talk so much about scientists and this podcast addressed a lot to PhDs and people in the scientific sphere. So are there potential jobs for scientists at Kutzkazakt and what if people want to apply to Kutzkazakt? What should what should they what is what is expected from applicants? Oh man, that like really depends on the job and like it varies quite a lot. So like it's uh, it's it's hard to say in, in general. So like I don't know. Oh. Um, so I think we're definitely we're looking to hire another fact checker this year, and uh, maybe another one next year. So like if that's something, um, okay. For this year, I think oh god, like I can like I'm just saying things. Let's let's see if someone's like angry at me later. But like I think for this year, we're looking for someone with like a physics background to do like be better uh, with like physics fact checking inside the company. Um, it's hard to give a straight answer. It really depends, like what job openings we have, and like, I mean, if you feel like it, just like, like drop us a line. What what also often happens is like that people, we got back to people once something uh, got available where we thought like, hey, remember that that dude or that 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 lady? Like like uh, they had like a really like they were like really great for that. We didn't need that back then, but like now we could need it. So we'll just like give them write them an email. And invite them, and if they're still free, great. Um, so yeah, but like, um, what what I'm always looking for, but what's like really hard to do, is like a, a really good science writer. Um, but to be to be fair, like like that's like that's like a hard position for us to um, fulfill, and like a hard position. So like, if if you apply, we will give you like a. Like a writing homework, basically, with that is a few days of work, um, and and still we we sadly have to decline most of the people who apply for those jobs. It's like, it's yeah, it's really it's really harsh. We're looking for something super specific, um, that often always only like like comes out once you see someone's writing. So gen okay, general advice: if you want to like get a writing position for us, you need to have like a few like actual examples and like like. Your doctor thesis is an example, like something that's like in the vein of like, hey, I summarize science for lay people. Um, having something like that would be great. And like for researchers, obviously, we'll get like we'll do a, like a research test where we like let someone like someone who already did the research uh, do like the research again just to see like, hey, did they find the the, the same things we found? Hey, we we know like like for this fact, there's like a trap. That you can run into if you do this like surface level. Let's see if they avoid that. And like stuff like that's like the things we we want to find out, because like in the end, like these these sort of positions have like like a lot of responsibility for the whole company. If like our research sucks, our videos suck, um, and that's that's like sad for all the other people doing that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, like it, this was like a super not straight answer, and I can't give a better. I one. think it was actually really good uh, to hear, like also like what kind of tasks you give them uh, during an interview, right? I mean, and I think it it makes a lot of sense if you're looking for a science writer that you actually have some of, or take someone who already has some experience um, summarizing information in a way that lay people can understand it, because that is your audience. So no, I think it was very uh, nice to give us uh, some. Um, Yes, information on that. 
So, th- so this actually uh, leads us into the community and the outreach aspect of the job that you you said you're kind of moving into this direction. So this this brings me to the question about YouTube, YouTube as a platform. We don't want you to implicate yourself in any in any bad way. So we we won't ask any leading or misleading questions. We just want to get some information. So what would you say are the biggest advantages or disadvantages of being on YouTube as a platform? Okay. So YouTubers are very superstitious when it comes to like the algorithm. And it, it doesn't help that the algorithm is real and like really like something changes a little bit and you're successful and something changes a little bit and like your video, like your views half overnight. And I, like, after doing this for so many years, I've, I've seen this with like colleagues, I've seen this with us. There is like, there is a, like a weird uh, invisible force operating here and it exists. Um, but so th- just like, like, like some sort of like nature god who's like going through the forest, most of the time it will just ignore you, right? So the, um, the, the answer why, why are my videos, why I'm not reaching people is, is sometimes the algorithm, but most of the time it's not. Um, so the, the thing is like in the end, I'm, I'm deeply believe, like, I de- although I'm, I, I feel like we have been punished by the algorithm in the past. Too. like it, it happens it really happens um and then like this nature force comes to you and like bashes you in the head and then it goes away again and you don't know what happened and why and then another day it comes and like like, like i don't know cherishes you and like lifts you up into the sky and we see you're so happy and think ah oh, nice and then it goes away and you dropped uh, in the uh, i don't know can't recommend the job honestly for that reason but yeah um so like if you do stuff on youtube that like is good and like is interesting to people you will find an audience full stop i I deeply believe in that and then there's like all sort of reasons all things you can do to improve but like in the end it really is a meritocracy that's that's the upside and the downside i just like explained it like it's it's i don't know it also can can be that you you're doing it for years and you're not reach people it's i don't know it's uh yeah it's a very, very sat- saturated platform, let's say it like that. But still, like, uh, um, if, if people want to, like, if people want to watch you, they will find you. Okay, so how maybe are you interacting with different um, YouTubers that are also in the science communication uh, field, I guess? I mean, I don't know. Like, just like, uh, over the years, some have become friends and we're, like, in regular contact or, like, uh, they're like sometimes events where, where you meet like colleagues and friends, but yeah, it's like, uh, I, that's, that's probably, I guess, like in all industries, it's just like, uh, people working a similar job. It's, it's weird since like most of them are like in the U S. Um, so, um, there's like not, not that many of us in Europe, but yeah, yeah, you know, each other, like you're closer with some people to meet, you see them more often than others and that's just like i mean i guess like just the normal career thing okay i mean have you met like i think recently uh the german there are some german science youtubers that have become more popular i'm just uh thinking that i think the max Planck society is actually collaborating with i think he's called mr wissen to go yeah yeah, yeah yeah if like, you've yeah. heard of him yeah, yeah. Or there's we, also yeah. this funk network that uh, i think who my lab is part of and i think she was uh, also a lot on tv uh, more recently yeah so we, we we know both of them we collaborated with them on videos i think with my lab we did the um electricity video and with mirko mirko is, is like more into like politics and history which is like not that much our thing so we we don't have like that that big of an overlap but yeah like we've uh we've known each other for like a long time and we, we like, and we, from time to time we run into each other at, at events and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So moving along to, so, you, so it's nice that you have collaborators and uh, you also are aware of the other YouTubers within the community, but when it comes to your public persona, like the public outreach, right? So you have, uh, quite a bit of interaction with your community i would say through the feedback through the comments and the likes mm-hmm. and stuff on the videos so uh, is that the primary way that you look for feedback or do you would you prefer if people wrote to you with certain things 
So what is the like? What is your how do how do you look for feedback and how do, how how what type of feedback do you generally receive? When I you mean, put if, if you do things on the internet, you can't avoid feedback <laughs> for better or for worse. Um, so I don't know, honestly. Like, the, like, like if you write us an email, the chances that we'll actually read it is way higher than if you comment, obviously. So it depends. So like, um, but we get all sorts of feedback, like pretty much nonstop. So like, there's like I don't know, thousands of comments. Like, but I, I'm, I'm not even sure like how many comments we get on an average day. Depends probably, but probably like like on average, like over a month at least like a thousand a day or something. I don't know. Um, so we can't read them all. And to be fair, like not YouTube comment, the YouTube comment section is not always like a source of great high quality feedback. Although sometimes it is. Don't put discard uh, feedback on YouTube. Also, it's like good to like it, it's that's like it's better to like get a general mood. Or like if if I used a funny meme in a video, then probably like fifty percent of our comments will be about that. Which is like I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, but yeah, people write emails and contact us on social media. So we have like I don't know. It is the, the closer you get to us, or like the more time you spend reaching us, the more likely it is that we will read it and it will reach us. But like in general, we get so much feedback, we we can reply to barely anything. It's, uh, we would need to like like two or three full time people to be able to, to we would do nothing than reply, and which is not feasible and doesn't make sense and like not yeah not an option. Okay, so how about for example then people that actually are negative on the in these comment sections? Do you completely ignore them or is there some kind of moderation going on if it's really bad? I mean, we we have like block keywords, so like um, and uh, so like all sorts of like racist words or like um, words that are like basically always only in comments that like shit on you basically get get the, like auto auto blocked um uh, again which like like people say like are not that aware of so they think oh they they, they let off steam and that's fine and like, but like it's 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 not visible um and I don't like it, it. Like if people have valid criticisms, uh, we'll we'll usually like, like like it does reach us. Like it's not like you can avoid it. And for example, like uh, when we make minor, like when we make mistakes, minor or bigger, or when we, for example, it's not always mistakes. Sometimes people who know well about a topic, when they see the way we lied, basically, like you always have to lie when you simplify. It's not it's not possible to not do that and but then the question is like do people agree with the way we lied in a video and sometimes they don't they don't and they think we made a mistake but often it's like a conscious decision to say like hey this is how we do it like if stuff like that happens like yeah i don't know sorry i i, I lost I lost my train of thought a little bit um so in general, negative feedback. We don't interact with it like too actively because it's like just like bad for your psyche. Um, but we notice it if it really points to a problem that's on the channel or in a video. Um, but yeah, it, like if if you're an asshole to us, we'll more like probably just like block you. <laughs> um, so like again, like if you have criticisms, the friendlier and more like calm it is carried to us, the more likely it is like we will hear it and respect it. And often like we, we did change things uh plenty of times because of your feedback. Or like scientist feedback who like contacted contacted us or I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so these are primary modes of audience interaction that you mentioned. But do you also have events that you had, or did you have events before COVID, uh, where you? No, we, we no. generally don't do events. So, like very seldomly. Yeah. So, okay. So, thanks a lot for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And uh, where can people find you? And uh, what do they do when they find you online? Okay, so, so me not 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 very well because I don't do social media, but like Kurzgesagt is available uh, on I guess all relevant social media platforms. Uh, yeah, and I guess I have a website and I have a book coming out in three months about the immune system. So if you're interested in a full 
immune system book in the Kurzberg style, that is soon going to be a thing. But yeah, that's basically it. Kurzgesagt is the best way to follow us. And yeah, it's like Kurzgesagt is not just me. It's like, a, it's again, like, it's this big team of amazingly hardworking people. So yeah, so that would be the, the way to follow us. And thank you very much for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. All right, you heard from the man himself. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it and uh, make sure to follow Kutzkazakt on YouTube because uh, if you haven't already, what are you doing, right? Uh, and there are links to the book that Philip mentioned in the description below and you should be able to find it and order it if you're interested. And we've also put a link to the most recent video from the Kutzkazakt channel talking about an introduction to the book. So if you're interested in that, make sure to go and listen. Anyway, I think it's been a very long episode already. And if you've listened this far, stay tuned and come back to us next week where we have another interesting discussion for you. And in the meantime, it's me saying bye-bye on behalf of Nico as well. So bye-bye. See you all next week. Officer Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the Science Communication Working Group on the Officer Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Shunat Ramkumar and the pre-intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. We're also on Twitter at mpphdnetpodcast, but on Instagram at offspringmagazine underscore the podcast, and find us on YouTube at the Max Planck PhD Net page as well. Okay. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye from me. Bye-bye.